The Depression era was a notorious time in American history, a time that left many people hopeless, with the only guarantee being that of despair. Jobs as well as wages were disappearing, stocks were dropping, and banks were getting robbed. The dark cloud that started raining down on Thursday, October 24th, 1929, until the following Tuesday of October 29th, 1929, altered our economic trajectory with the beginning of the Great Depression. During that time, the Federal Reserve also raised the interest rates, inflicting further hardships on the American people, enhancing the harsh realities of those already living in poverty or working lower-class blue-collar jobs. This wasn't just a domestic issue either. This became an international problem, which transformed some countries into hotbeds of nationalism and fascism. Even the end of Prohibition in the 1930s didn't ease the economic shortcomings the way our government had hoped it would. This led to an uptick in criminal gangs that focused on good old-fashioned bank robberies. See, people were bitter towards the banking system and Federal Reserve at the time due to folks losing their way of life, their farms, and their homes. It's not unheard of in human nature for action or retaliation when people are desperate, bitter, or even just envious. Which takes us to the criminal underworld of the Depression-era gangsters that made Robin Hood look softer than a wet loaf of bread. Outlaws during that time figured in how much it would benefit their crimes and reputation if they added automatic weapons and fast cars to their arsenals. Creepy Alvin Carpus and Fred Barker were two eager outlaws who believed it was their duty to steal money back from the systematic institutions that were starving their families and fellow citizens. And that is where this story takes us today as we break down the barker Carpus gang. Fred Barker was born in Missouri before relocating with his family to Oklahoma in the early 1900s. Fred came from a family of people that thrived on criminal behavior. His siblings were known gangsters locally and his mother, Mob Barker, was a reputed criminal too. It didn't take long for Fred's first arrest in 1927, which to no one's surprise was for burglary. It was during that time in prison that he met Alvin Carpus in the Kansas State Penitentiary, which was located in Lansing, Kansas. They struck up a friendship, even though there was a defined contrast in their personalities as Fred was more outgoing and likable, while Alvin had a deadly reputation and awkward personality. After their release in 1930, they decided to team up and start a gang. Among the other members was Fred's brother Doc Barker, Lawrence Duvall, Frank Nash, Harvey Bailey, Bernie Phillips, Fern Miller, Harry Campbell, and William Weaver. Oh, and uh, Ma Barker as well. Shortly after their release from prison, they went to Tulsa, Oklahoma, where Fred and Alvin were caught and arrested again in 1931 for stealing. Seems to be a little bit of a pattern here. Barker eventually escaped from prison, but Carpus pled guilty to the charges and served his four-year sentence before eventually going and meeting his partner in crime up in Missouri. Not long after that, tragedy struck on November 8, 1931 in the town of Pocahontas, Arkansas. While Fred Barker and some members of the gang were driving around the small town looking for a place to hit a score, they stopped so Weaver could take a leak. While he was relieving himself, a town law enforcement official named Manley Jackson started writing down their license plate numbers. While doing so, he was caught by Fred Barker and kidnapped before being driven out of town and executed with several shots to the back. Some context about the death of Manley Jackson was that his death wasn't attributed to the Barker Carpus gang until decades later. Originally, two men named Lige Dame and Earl Decker were convicted of Manley Jackson's death. Then maybe a month later, they were also the culprits behind the death of a sheriff from West Plains, Missouri named C. Roy Kelly. Now, what we know so far is that this gang is violent, they're killers, and they are indiscriminate of their victims and I say that because it's usually pretty common knowledge that you don't shoot or kill law enforcement as it's almost a guaranteed death sentence, rather from other police or lethal injection. Or I guess the electric chair if we're referencing their times. From Missouri, they went to Minnesota where they originally met Frank Jelly Nash. Nash was a skilled bank robber and he was always eager to show his talents. That was when the gang truly developed their identity, which became synonymous with their name, and that was robbing banks and kidnapping. 
1932 was a prominent year for the gang, as they suggested they robbed at least 11 banks, but it is believed that the number was much higher than that. However, 1933 was a special year for the gang as they decided to evolve into a more dangerous gang. A game that requires more patience. Instead of just going in and robbing banks in a matter of minutes, they decided to start kidnapping prominent men for ransoms. The first victim of their new entrepreneurial expedition was William Ham, and he was an heir to a rich family from Minnesota that owned a brewery. Surprisingly, he was released without any real harm after they received their ransom of $100,000, which in 1933 was equivalent to about $2,400,500 today. So I would say that was no small catch. On August 30th, 1933, they robbed a bank in St. Paul. During the robbery, they got into a gunfight with officers John Yeaman and Leo Pavlak. Officer Pavlak lost his life, but Yeaman survived within an inch of his after suffering several gunshot wounds, including one to the face. Then, their second kidnapping victim was Edward George Bremer Jr. He was president of a bank in St. Paul, Minnesota. They were brutal during his kidnapping, both pistol whipping him and assaulting him in different ways. They eventually leveraged around 200000 out of that ransom, but they made a mistake. Doc Barker left his fingerprints on a gas can where they swapped Edward Bremer Jr. for the ransom money. Aside from the fingerprint, Alvin Karpus was then awarded the infamous title of Public Enemy No. 1, adding even more public speculation to their whereabouts. The heat was on the gang now, and it was simmering like a southern fish fry, so they decided to split up. It's also important to note that they killed one of their associates, a man named George Zegler, who had began telling people about their kidnapping of Edward Bremer Jr. George Zegler was executed on March 22nd of 1934 by his associates because he had become a loose end who couldn't keep his mouth shut, but what they didn't realize when they left his body is that Zegler had a ton of their information on him including names, addresses, and aliases used to evade capture, which offered law enforcement far more extensive leads than what they had previously had. Arthur Barker was caught in early January 1935 and sent to prison. Then, on January 16th of 1935 near Lake Ware in Florida, the police tracked Ma and Fred Barker and got into a shootout with them. It's estimated that 1,500 rounds were fired during the violent exchange. Fred and Ma Barker were killed that day. While on the run, Alvin Karpis managed to rob a train in Ohio before getting in a shootout with police himself in New Jersey and barely escaping. Soon after, Karpis was hiding out in Hot Springs, Arkansas because it was a known sanctuary for criminals due to the corruption of the town officials. But in March of 1936, the police raided a house in Hot Springs that they believed belonged to Alvin Karpus. Upon their raid, they discovered Alvin had already booked it down to New Orleans. Soon after that though, Alvin Karpus and his luck ran out as he was tracked down and arrested on May 1st of 1936. He eventually pled guilty to his crimes including kidnapping. Arthur Barker, he died in 1939 during an attempt to escape prison. Alvin Karpus was released from prison after serving 33 years and he eventually died in 1979. Unfortunately, this is one of those stories that ended up with the lives of multiple people being lost. However, I do hope you enjoyed this gritty but short story about the Depression Era gangsters. As always, thank you for watching. Please stick up the like button, subscribe and have a wonderful rest of your day.